Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this is part two of the two-part series on the oxygen situation at South Summit on May 10, 1996. Over the years, various debates have taken place about who the heroes were and who caused all the problems. This video is going to take a look at the actions of Andy Harris and show why he fully deserved the New Zealand Bravery Star he was posthumously awarded. Of course, everybody knows about Anatoly Bukrev, but it should be noted that both Bukrev and Harris descended without oxygen in front of all their clients so they could get to their oxygen cache and bring oxygen back up to distressed climbers. Mountain Madness's cache was at South Cole, and Adventures Consultants was up higher at South Summit because of the large number of Adventure Consultants clients who had turned around earlier in the day. Both Bukrev and Harris attempted to rescue the lead guide for their team, and neither was successful. And while Bukrev is rightly credited for saving the lives of numerous people, Harris's actions were just as selfless, even though they were ultimately unsuccessful. The unfortunate other thing that Bukrev and Harris share is that their actions were unfairly treated in the best-selling book, Into Thin Air. In Krakauer's book, Harris is reported to be completely hypoxic and irrationally insisting that oxygen bottles at South Summit are not full. Problems are blamed on Harris for coming over the radio and insisting that the bottles are not full, while Krakauer implies that they were indeed full. This video will show that not only was Andy Harris correct, the oxygen bottles were not full, but John Krakauer knew about this from the beginning. But a narrative that says, it doesn't matter if you pay a top guiding service $65,000 to guide you up Everest because someone is just going to steal your oxygen and you will die anyway. That is not going to sell a lot of tickets. So Krakauer's narrative ignored the overwhelming evidence that oxygen mysteriously went missing from South Summit. This video will focus on Andy Harris and the oxygen situation relating to Rob Hall and Doug Hansen. Of course, Doug Hansen should not have been climbing that day. Hansen made the decision to turn around earlier that morning, and Rob Hall spoke with him and convinced him to push on to the summit. That decision ultimately cost the lives of Rob Hall, Doug Hansen, and Andy Harris. This video is going to look at the oxygen situation at South Summit and show how Andy Harris was trying to alert people to the serious problem that the oxygen simply was not there. First, let me set up this photo, which is the color version of the photo on page 11 of Into Thin Air Illustrated Edition. The following is labeled by Krakauer in his caption. The photo is from 3.20 p.m. It is taken by Neil Beidelman. This is Doug Hansen. This is Sandy Pittman. And that is Anatoly Bukriv. In general, when Krakauer and I agree on something, I do not take the time to detail why the information is correct. And Krakauer and I agree on a whole lot of things about the climb. Pretty much every single one of his captions for a photo that describes what is happening in that photo is accurate. Such is the case with this photo. And while I am aware that memories at altitude can be problematic, for the major events on South Summit that I label in this photo, all accounts agree on the exact same thing. There are three major accounts of South Summit on the descent, Bukrev, Krakauer, and Grooms. Uh, Gamelgard, Fox, and Beidelman arrive later at South Summit, so their accounts are not relevant to this video. So although three different people who wrote books were at South Summit, their accounts all agree what time things took place, who was there, and the basics of what was done. Everyone agrees that sometime before 3 p.m., John Krakauer broke down approximately here. He was out of oxygen and could not continue the traverse over to South Summit. Everyone agrees that he remained there until Mike Groom passed and gave him his oxygen bottle. Everyone agrees that when they got back to South Summit, both Groom and Harris were out of oxygen, Harris having run out higher up and Groom having given his to Krakauer. All accounts agree that Groom, Krakauer, and Yasko Namba left South Summit after Bukrev. So they are there in this photo, just not easily visible. Similarly, there are other items everyone agrees on, and I'll mark them here, even though the events would not take place until much later. This is the location Rob Hall would die. Andy Harris's ice axe was found right next to him, so likely Harris perished there as well. For Doug Hansen's ice axe, that was found also approximately where Krakauer broke down. The route heads back up towards South Summit at that point, and when you are without oxygen, even a mild uphill climb is significantly different from going downhill. 
Here is Martin Adams describing Krakauer's incident in The Climb. I'm on the traverse, and here's Krakauer laid out, hanging on his ice axe, something of a self belay. He's got the handle of his axe driven into the snow, and he's holding on to the head. And I'm wondering, what am I going to do here? Because neither one of us is clipped to a fixed rope. So Krakauer was holding on to his ice axe until someone rescued him, and Doug Hansen would later hold on to his ice axe in that same location for as long as he could. Eventually, Hansen let go, and exactly what time that was remains unknown. As in 1924, the location of an ice axe is a good indication of where the person fell from. So Bukrev estimates he left South Summit at 3.25 p.m., and Krakauer labels the photo of him leaving at 3.20 p.m. I do not view this as a major difference. Rather than showing that different people remember things differently, it shows the exact opposite. It shows that for major events of the climb, all the participants remember the exact same events, and those events match up with photos of the mountain taken that day. What this video will look at is not three different people remembering the same event differently. It will look at one person writing about the same event with three different versions, all contained in the exact same book. Now that the photo is set up, you need to go get your copy of Into Thin Air, as we will look in detail at what Krakauer wrote about the events at South Summit. I will read the key portions, but you will need to fill in the rest from your own book and verify that I am not taking anything out of context or leaving out any important details. There are no Jedi mind tricks being used. We are going to read what Krakauer wrote and try to make sense of it. This picks up on chapter 14 on page 195. Krakauer is stranded and needs to get some help to get back to South Summit. Over at South Summit, I could see Andy Harris sorting through a pile of orange oxygen bottles. Yo, Harold, I yelled. Could you bring me a fresh bottle? There's no oxygen here, the guide shouted back. These bottles are all empty. Groom then rescues Krakauer, and they head over to South Summit. At this point, Groom is without oxygen, and he notes in his book that the lack of oxygen caused him to miss some key things that were going on. Returning to Krakauer, When we got there, at South Summit... An examination of the oxygen cache immediately revealed that there were at least six full bottles. Andy, however, refused to believe it. He kept insisting that they were all empty, and nothing Mike or I said could convince him otherwise. The only way to know how much gas is in a canister is to attach it to your regulator and read the gauge. Presumably, this is how Andy had checked the bottles at the South Summit. Now, I have to interrupt the story there and say that none of that makes any sense. First, it is complete nonsense that anyone would attach a regulator to a bottle just to see how much oxygen is in it. So let's look at how the POSIX bottles work. They are not like welding oxygen bottles where you attach a regulator and then open the valve to the tank. They have a spring valve that gets depressed as you screw in the regulator. This causes oxygen to vent into the atmosphere until you form a seal by tightening down the regulator. If a bottle has oxygen in it, a loud hissing sound will come out of the bottle as the regulator is screwed in and the oxygen is vented into the atmosphere. This is extremely loud, about as loud as a person shouting. If you are fast with screwing the regulator in, perhaps only 2 to 3 liters vent before getting a seal. If you are slow, perhaps 10 or 20 liters. When you detach the bottle and it still has oxygen in it, it will also vent until the spring valve is closed by removing the regulator. Typically, it is faster to unscrew the regulator than to screw it in. Thus, you are going to lose oxygen when you attach the regulator and lose oxygen when you detach the regulator, but the loss on the removal will be slightly less. The idea that people were sitting at South Summit attaching and detaching their regulators just to see how much oxygen is in a bottle is ridiculous nor is attaching a regulator such an easy task. You generally take your mittens off so you can properly match the threads between the bottle and the regulator. Experienced Sherpa can do this with the mittens on, but it is unlikely that anyone at South Summit that day could do it so easily, largely because they were without oxygen. It also takes a little bit of time to put the regulator on and take it off. Thus, Krakauer's statement that they examined the bottles and immediately determined that there were at least six full bottles is clearly not referring to attaching a regulator to each one. The astute viewer has noticed that nowhere did Krakauer say they attached a regulator to each bottle and thus wasted precious oxygen just to check if the bottle was full or not. 
most likely the way they thought they had immediately determined if a bottle was full was by looking at the protective caps. New bottles would have the protective cap, and in general, used bottles would not, unless somebody swapped their used bottle for one of your new ones and replaced the protective cap so it was not completely obvious someone had stolen your oxygen. Another way to determine whether a bottle is full or not is by simply picking it up. Krakauer reported a full 1996 bottle weighed 6.6 pounds. They hold 1.1 kilograms of oxygen, or 2.4 pounds. This is equivalent to 770 liters of oxygen at standard temperature and pressure. Weighing the cylinder is the most accurate way to determine the oxygen content because the pressure will vary with temperature while the weight will not. Thus a full bottle would weigh 6.6 .6 pounds and an empty bottle 4.2 pounds. Most people could tell the difference between a full bottle and an empty one, but it is difficult to tell the difference between an empty bottle and a partially full bottle, especially when at altitude and operating without oxygen. Most likely, Harris was picking up the bottles and he could determine they were not full. But this method is far more subjective than Krakauer stating that Harris presumably attached his regulator to each bottle. Krakauer would have been able to easily hear it if Harris attached his regulator to a bottle with oxygen in it. So Krakauer tells us there are at least six full bottles on South Summit, but he does not say how he knows they are full. Implied, using his innuendo technique, is that somebody attached a regulator to them and the gauge showed it was full. But there is no reason to believe anyone was so stupid as to do that and vent a bunch of oxygen. Nor did anyone report hearing anyone do this, and it would have been extremely loud. Krakauer then goes on to an analysis of what happened on South Summit, which has the benefit of being written at sea level, months after the events took place, with all the time necessary to reflect and make sure that the facts were reported to the reader correctly. Krakauer first speculates that perhaps Harris's regulator had malfunctioned. After the expedition, Neil Bideman pointed out that if Andy's regulator had become fouled with ice, the gauge might have registered empty, even though the canisters were full, which would explain his bizarre obstinacy. And if his regulator was perhaps on the fritz and not delivering oxygen to his mask, that would also explain Andy's apparent lack of lucidity. This possibility, which now seems self-evident, didn't occur to either Mike or me at the time. However, in hindsight, Andy was acting irrationally and had plainly slipped well beyond routine hypoxia, but I was so mentally impeded myself that it simply didn't register. It is not clear why that possibility would appear self-evident. Clearly, Krakauer could attach his own regulator to the bottle and show Harris that it was full. Krakauer highly implied that they connected regulators to the six supposedly full bottles, and it is not clear why, if they had done that, they couldn't simply show the regulator to Harris. In addition, even if Harris's regulator was broken, the oxygen bottle would still vent while the broken regulator was being attached. Everyone around would have heard this. No one reported anyone repeatedly venting oxygen from bottles, though likely either Groom, Martin Adams, or Clef Schoening would have said something at some point if this was going on. In addition, Harris's oxygen system clearly had the flow indicator on it, so if his regulator was on the fritz and not supplying oxygen, this could easily be verified just by looking at the flow bubble. Returning to crack hour, as Andy continued to assert that there were no full bottles at South Summit, Mike looked at me quizzically. I looked back and shrugged. Turning to Andy, I said, no big deal, Harold, much ado about nothing. Then I grabbed a new oxygen canister, screwed it into my regulator, and headed down the mountain. Harold is a nickname for Andy Harris. Now, Krakauer did not say he showed the gauge to Harris. But at this point, there is the innuendo that the bottle was full. If you look carefully, you will see that Krakauer says new and not full. Writing from the comfort of his home, Krakauer concluded that Harris was acting irrationally because Harris kept insisting that the bottles were not full. In hindsight, Andy was acting irrationally and had plainly slipped well beyond routine hypoxia, but I was so mentally impeded myself that it simply didn't register. My inability to discern the obvious was exacerbated to some degree by the guide client protocol. Andy and I were very similar in terms of physical ability and technical expertise. Had we been climbing together in a non-guided situation as equal partners, it is inconceivable to me that I would have neglected to recognize his plight.
So that is Krakauer's thought-out conclusion, written in a book published a year after the events took place, while he had plenty of time to think about what had happened. His conclusion is that Andy Harris was acting irrationally because Harris was insisting the bottles were not full. Those are Krakauer's exact words. Andy continued to assert that there were no full bottles at South Summit. Now, get your copy of Into Thin Air and turn four pages forward. This is where Krakauer is descending alone and at the top of the fixed ropes that the Montenegrins put in the day prior. Krakauer reports the time is just after 6 p.m. Wrapping the fixed line around my arms to repel, I continued down through the blizzard. Some minutes later, I was overwhelmed by a disturbingly familiar feeling of suffocation, and I realized that my oxygen had once again run out. Three hours earlier, when I attached my regulator to my third and last oxygen canister, I noticed that the gauge indicated that the bottle was only half full. Let me read that again. I noticed that the gauge indicated that the bottle was only half full. I'd figured that that would be enough to get me most of the way down, though, so I hadn't bothered exchanging it for a full one, and now the gas was gone. So when Krakauer connected his regulator to what he had just said was one of the new bottles on South Summit that they had determined somehow to be full, it was indeed not full, but the gauge indicated it was only half full. And that was fully recognized by Krakauer at the time. It is not clear how he would have exchanged it for a full one because he had no idea if any full ones existed. All that stuff about Harris being irrational, how they just couldn't convince him that the bottles were full, it was all nonsense. Harris thought the bottles were not full because the bottles were not full, not even close to full. Now, let's look at Krakauer's assessment that it was even half full. The photo is from 3.20, and Brugrave is just leaving. Krakauer leaves about 10 minutes after that, and right after he attaches the final bottle. Krakauer was on Groom's bottle prior to that, so there was no urgency for Krakauer to switch. So Krakauer's bottle lasted from 3.30 until 6 p.m., just two and a half hours. His first bottle lasted seven hours, and his second bottle lasted somewhere between six and a half and seven hours. Using the six and a half as the conservative estimate for a full bottle for Krakauer, a bottle that lasts only two and a half hours is only 38% full. And while that may not seem like much, it indicated that the gauge was probably well below the halfway point. And also, when you look at where Yasko Namba broke down and was out of oxygen, it is right about at that same spot that Krakauer ran out at the top of the Montenegrin ropes. It appears that Namba also received a partially full bottle, which robbed her of at least three hours of oxygen. Had Yasko received a full bottle at South Summit, likely she would have walked off the mountain. But for whatever reason, she didn't check her gauge at South Summit, and Krakauer, who confirmed that he did check his own gauge, could not be bothered to simply say, my bottle is only half full. Had he said those six words, likely Yasko Namba would be alive today, as it would have keyed Groom into the problem with the bottles. Groom could have switched his full bottle with Namba and sent her and Krakauer down with another partial bottle for Krakauer. Krakauer was carrying his empty bottles down, so it would have been no problem just switching one of his empties for a partial, and then he and Namba could descend, and he could switch to his final partial at the balcony, while Groom and Harris remained at South Summit to sort out that bottle problem for Rob. Would Krakauer have abandoned Yasko if they both had enough oxygen to make it back to camp? I would hope not. Also, had Krakauer simply said, my bottle is only half full, rather than much ado about nothing, it would have caused Groom to call Rob Hall. Groom, Harris, and Hall all had radios. Would they have been able to save Doug Hansen if a call went out at 3.30 that the oxygen was gone? They had Groom, Harris, Hall, and Ann Dorje all at South Summit or above. Rob Hall had a rope, so if they could have sorted out which bottles had the most oxygen, they had only to carry them to the base of the Hillary Step and have Rob pull them up with a rope. Even identifying the most full of the partially full bottles could get Rob and Doug the oxygen they need to get down the step. Would it be enough for them to get back to South Cole? Too difficult to say, because we don't know how much oxygen was missing. For the 1996 climb, 
two simple things could have drastically changed the outcome. The first is that Rob Hall could have let Doug Hansen return to camp early that morning when Hansen had turned around from not feeling well. The second would be Krakauer informing Groom that his bottle was only half full while at South Summit. The main criticism of Krakauer is not that he couldn't be bothered to say that his bottle was only half full. He was at altitude and his mental capacity was severely diminished. Such are the effects of altitude. Krakauer was just quoting nonsense from Shakespeare and should not be expected to act rationally when he was completely mentally incapacitated. The criticism is that while writing from the comfort of his home, he dishonored the memory of Andrew Harris by saying it was Harris who was acting irrationally. Harris was not irrational. The bottles were not full. Had people listened to Harris, lives would have been saved. While Harris was certainly hurting from altitude, it is disingenuous to say that he was acting irrationally. Krakauer saw his own bottle was nowhere close to full and simply said much ado about nothing. Harris was rationally telling people that the bottles were not full. Krakauer was irrationally quoting Shakespeare when he knew his bottle was nowhere close to full. I am not blaming Krakauer for what he did on the mountain. I am blaming him for what he wrote in his book and the way he gaslit his readers by moving the information about his bottle only being half full to a part where it wasn't really relevant. Now, we need to look at where the oxygen disappeared to. The Taiwanese team had been relatively slow the entire day, reaching the South Summit well after the other teams. And yet their, their climb time above the South Summit is extremely fast. So fast that Krakauer did not believe their reported summit time of 3 p.m. and just moved it back to 3.45 in his book. However, turning back to this photo from 3.20, the Taiwanese would need to be fairly close to where this photo was taken. Doug Hanschen reached the summit a little after 4 p.m. and he was going extremely slow. In addition, Neil Beidelman reported leaving the summit at 3.10 after the bulk of climbers reached the summit as the other main groups from both Fisher and Hall's team were all on the summit by 2.30, it is very likely that one of the groups Beidelman saw reach the summit was the Taiwanese team, closer to 3 p.m. There's also this photo of Mac Logau. Unfortunately, it is cropped, so we can't see who else is on the summit at that time, but the clear blue sky is more indicative of an earlier time. By 3.45, the wind had picked up and there was a plume coming off the mountain, and so while this picture is not determinative of what time he was on the summit, it is more consistent with an earlier time. Now, in terms of oxygen theft, it should be noted that there has never been a case of proven oxygen theft in the history of Mount Everest. Sure, oxygen bottles go missing all the time, but there are innocent explanations, such as the bottles rolling downhill or the person simply having miscounted how many bottles were placed in the cache. There is this bizarre belief system prevalent in YouTube videos and comments that unless you have documented video evidence of something, then it is just a conspiracy theory. However, despite there being no definitive proof that a single oxygen bottle has ever been stolen in the history of climbing Mount Everest, modern expeditions take extreme measures to prevent oxygen bottle theft. Even in 1996, Dave Brashears had locked up his expedition's oxygen supplies at South Coal to prevent their theft. As soon as Brashears heard that there were people in distress, he immediately told the teams they could have his oxygen. It was John Krakauer who went to the IMAX expedition tent and, with Dave Brashears' permission, took a knife and cut into the locked tent to open up the IMAX oxygen reserves. Curiously, Krakauer does not mention the need to cut the tent open with a knife because the bottles were locked up because they were worried about oxygen bottle theft. For that, you need to read Ed Veister's The Mountain. But that is probably just Krakauer's faulty memory that caused him to forget about cutting open a tent with a knife, and not because Krakauer's narrative didn't have any room for people being worried about oxygen being stolen. And while no one has come forward and stated they stole oxygen from South Summit, we do have this rather curious statement from Mac Logau. Because this was my first time to climb the South Summit from Nepal, I asked a Sherpa, where is the Hillary Step? He said it was still in front of us. I asked how long it would take to get there, and the Sherpas said around one to two hours. Then I saw the climbers from the American team and the New Zealand team in front of us. Some were not moving at all, and some were moving very slowly. I understood that it was very high, and they couldn't walk as easily on, as on the flat land. I thought, if it's just one or two hours, I could do it. Plus, there were some Sherpa from the American team and the New Zealand team who were carrying oxygen, 
and maybe some team members also had some. So I thought what I should do is concentrate on climbing and reach the top and not think about anything else. I would only concentrate and hope I would succeed. Now, I don't know what to make of that statement about the Sherpa carrying the oxygen. He would have known that the other members had turned around and that would mean there would be extra oxygen at South Summit. I will also note that in the climb, Bukhrev states that there is a minor discrepancy in the Mountain Madness oxygen. Ultimately, what happened to the oxygen at South Summit remains a mystery, as it remains a mystery why John Krakauer looked at his bottle and saw that it was only half full and yet wrote in his book that Andy Harris was acting irrationally because Harris was saying the bottles were not full. Andy Harris may not have been operating at 100%, but he correctly identified that the bottles were not full. And for that, I will make him an honorary Yeti. He kept speaking the truth, even though no one listened.